afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Little Lunch Lectures. It's December the 18th. Um, hope everyone's having a good one so far. My name is Stephanie Borett. I'm the Director of Donor Relations at the Coastal Land Trust. Um, for anyone who has not yet joined us on Little Lunch Lectures, we're, we're on week, like, I don't know, 30, 40 something at this point. So many of you are, are repeat um, attendees and we're glad to have you back. Um, if you are first time with us, though, I did want to let you know that we are recording and we're live on Facebook. Um, so you can feel free to leave your video on or off. It's up to you. Um, but of course, we always do love to see our participants if you don't care. Um, uh, Laura is going to post some links in the chat if you would like to um, if you'd like to stay connected with the Coastal Land Trust via our weekly e-news or um, if you would like to make a donation to us, there will be a link in the chat. it will make that easier for you. Um, and then finally, we'll keep everybody on mute until the end of the talk and then there will be opportunity to ask some questions. Um, if you would like to put a question in the chat instead, I will be happy to read that out loud to our speaker and we can continue our Q&A that way. So whatever you like the best. Um, I am delighted today to introduce to you Ben Jones. He is the Coastal Crescent Project Manager at the Friends of the Mountains to Sea Trail. His work includes uh, outreach, analysis, planning, design, and construction for the newly established Coastal Crescent route of the MST. Um, it's kind of a big job and we're going to learn a little bit more about that today. Um, ben is working with community stakeholders, public land managers, and volunteers to build something special for the state of North Carolina. Ben studied environmental studies and horticultural science, and these perspectives have helped him understand the importance of the Mountains to Sea Trail as both a public resource and as a catalyst for conservation and restoration in our region. Uh, thanks, Ben, for being with us today and for sharing your time and your expertise with us, and um, we look forward to uh, hearing your story. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for providing us with um, the opportunity to share uh, the story of MST with all of you. And um, just for those of you who may not be familiar with it, I wanted to just introduce it. Um, so it's uh, the State Trail of North Carolina, and we're um, affiliated with state parks, even though I work for the nonprofit arm supporting the Mountains to Sea Trail. And it's a um, 12,000, or I'm sorry, <laughs> 1,200 mile long trail, uh, not quite that long, um, across the state from uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park to Jockey's Ridge State Park. And the trail is a work in progress. Um, if you look at this map, you can see the red line represents our finished off-road trail. The black lines represent the current route along roads for uh, the many people who choose to do the entirety of the trail. And then the dotted lines represent um, alternative routes that are in progress. And the blue line here is our paddle route along the Noose River. And so um, when I started with the Mount Sea Trail, uh, finishing my landscape architecture degree in uh, 2018, um, I was tasked with what you see here to the south, which is working on the Coastal Crescent route. Um, and just to zoom in on that, so originally the Mountains to Sea Trail was planned to follow the Noose River Corridor down to Croatan National Forest, where we currently have the Nusiak Trail. And um, over time, um, it became a real challenge to find a way forward due to a lack of public land um, in that corridor and for various other uh, you know, physiological reasons as well. So um, our director, Kate Dixon, um, in collaboration with uh, conservation uh, partners that she had known for a long period of time, decided to find a new overland route um, in an area where there was this conservation work happening and there was more opportunities to complete an overland trail. So state parks and us, we still envision a, a land route along the Noose River Corridor eventually, um, but for the time being, it's um, really most functional as a paddle route. And, and so this project here, you can see um, we split from the original route in Smithfield 
And there's a lot of black line here, right? Which means there's just not a lot of trail yet. So this was um, in 2017 when it became an official part of the MST. And so um, upon that happening, sort of the low hanging fruit pre-existing trail is what was focused on to, to sort of establish the MST in places like Jones Lake State Park and Singletary Lake State Park, um, for example. And so my job since um, starting in 2018 was to help find the best path forward um, in some of those areas. And so um, part of this presentation is, uh, is coming directly from our soon to be finished and posted to our website, uh, trail development plan, uh, which I'm very excited about. It's been the culmination of a lot of work and, and outreach and, um, and just a very, um, educational process for me. And so it was, this is our follow up to our 2018 strategic plan. And in this one, we wanted to really identify what trail can be built, how and how much it would cost. And so the function of this document, and we won't get into the weeds of it here, but it's really to provide a blueprint for fundraising um, and for advocacy um, for specific trail routes. And so if we're able to accomplish what we hope to from this plan and these proposals, we would go from having our current 58, uh, approximately 58 miles of trail to having 135 miles of trail and removing 70.8 miles of road walking. So that would be a huge transformation for the Coastal Crescent Trail. Um, and it would be um, based on our um, calculations a cost between five and a half million and 12 million which for 106.5 miles of new trail is really not that bad um, and I'll talk to you uh, brief uh, soon about kind of the discrepancy between those two numbers we've identified sort of the minimum acquisition scenarios and the maximum acquisition scenarios and the reason for that um, is that we would love to acquire as much land as possible we really want the trail to function as a conservation catalyst. Um, but we understand that not all landholders are gonna be interested in that and we're not always gonna have funding for that. So we've chosen to use a um, 100 meter wide corridor as our baseline there. And so again, this just shows that we'd be jumping from about 18.7% um, completion on the trail to um, a total of about 43% completion of the Coastal Crescent uh, based on these proposals. And I know you guys are probably familiar with this um, image, but um, again, we really wanted to hammer home in this document and in our process, how important the conservation community is to the trail establishment process and hopefully how important we could potentially be in helping create new opportunities for conservation in what is one of the most diverse areas in the Eastern United States. Uh, not just because of the ecology is it valuable though. Um, we think that all of these really beautiful um, uh, historic uh, structures, um, historic landmarks really enrich the trail experience in these communities as well. And we're excited to showcase them in addition to the, the, the landscapes. So back in 2018, our strategic plan really identified eight places where we could get started expanding the trail. Um, and our document that we'll be going through parts of today is really a follow up on seven of those eight locations. Um, uh, the sixth location here in Pender County, uh, we were able to sort of accomplish our goal and establish a river ferry that would take people from uh, White Stocking to the entrance of Holly Shelter. Um, and so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on the coastal um, components of this, which actually starts with section or uh, focus area two uh, through eight. Um, and our process is something I'm pretty excited about and I wanted to share with you because it kind of shows the due diligence we're doing and, and how we're trying to set a high standard for how we evaluate these landscapes for trail because trail sometimes can be associated with ecological degradation and, and rightfully so there, there are ways that people misuse the landscape um, when there's public access. Um, but at any rate, uh, we're, we've been starting the process with understanding the history and ecology of the sites. And one of the tools we've used um, is the original USDA series one aerial photographs. And you can see here, this is Jones Lake. 
uh, and Turnbull Creek in Bladen County. And so this is an aerial image uh, collage essentially of multiple aerials uh, from 1938. And it really helps us understand the history of land use and, and what areas were clear cut, what areas were agricultural, what areas had um, you know, communities established over time. And then we can fill in the details from uh, people's you know, uh, personal experiences and word of mouth. And then more importantly, almost uh, really in the coastal plain is understanding the land form. So we use uh, LIDAR data, uh, LIDAR elevation data to create 3D models not only the beauty of these landscapes because you can just tell looking at you know these Carolina Bay formations uh, and the historic curvatures of Turnbull Creek how beautiful it is but it's also it also makes it really easy for us to find low impact and lower cost ways to get through these often challenging uh, and wet landscapes and then with that information you know there's only so far you can go when you're sitting at your computer at home and so We've been meeting with and consulting with these land managers um, and local stakeholders and ground truthing what we find through our analysis. Um, this is Hans Rohr. Uh, he's been a great advocate of ours at Bladen Lake State Forest and we're excited to be adding trail continually um, at this uh, state land. And then the next uh, step that went into this process was just proposing a trail route. And there's tons of alternatives in all these locations um, you know, there's a lot of different ways we can go, but we wanted to be able to pick a route, whether we end up with it or not, just for the purpose of fully analyzing it and getting accurate numbers of cost um, to give us uh, something to build on, and, and especially when it comes to advocating for grant money to really understand what the costs are. And so with that, we develop our land acquisition cost estimates, both for the 100 meter corridor and the full parcel acquisition. And then we also have developed construction cost estimates for the trail based on uh, how much wetland it crosses and maps associated with that. And so with all that together, we feel like we've got a nice package uh, to understand how we can move forward um, in these areas so that we can get to the really fun part of the work, which is really building our trail community um, and building the trail and engaging people and having people experience these landscapes that uh, many may not have ever had a chance to experience. So um, what I'm gonna do is just jump through uh, some of these locations and we can always revisit if you have questions later on. Uh, so our second location is in Sampson County um, and it is at the Pondberry Bay Preserve and in uh, downtown Roseboro, North Carolina. And this is an image from the Pondberry Bay Preserve which is owned by the Plant Conservation Program of North Carolina uh, through the USDA, uh, where they have the endangered Pondberry Bay on site, but they also have a massive landscape of longleaf pine and a lot of opportunities um, beyond just that one endangered plant. And then downtown Roseboro, where the abandoned rail corridor that cuts right through this image you see, um, we're working to help uh, them revitalize that as a greenway through the downtown and a sort of flexible use uh, public park amenity uh, functioning for the trail. And there's a lot of these wonderful communities um, in all of these different areas where we're working. And so you can see on this map, um, our current route follows all roads. And in Sampson County, we currently have no trail. And in Sampson County, there are no state parks. Um, and so Sampson County is an area where we're really hoping to provide sort of an anchor point not only for the MST, but just for outdoor recreation of this type in general. And so um, this is by far the largest um, state-owned piece of property and natural area uh, in, in this region. And so we've proposed having the, the Mountains to Sea Trail connect through the property and then across the uh, Little Coharie Creek, acquiring two properties um, on the other side. This is the original location um, of the stagecoach road that crossed through here in the 1800s, early 1800s. And on this property uh, is the, the ruins of the old homestead of Governor Gabriel Holmes. Um, a bunch of tar cones and, and a lot of sort of traces of history here. So um, it's an exciting opportunity. And then in downtown Roseboro, following the abandoned uh, rail corridor, into their downtown. So we're really excited because there's a lot of variation here of, of what's possible. Um, 
I'll just quickly go through. This is a rendering uh, I did of what the potential is for the trail as it relates to the uh, abandoned home site or the uh, historic home site. Uh, this is an image of the uh, abandoned rail corridor next to um, an AME church and uh, the old brick cone silo from the original sawmill uh, for which Roseboro really became a town and sort of an image of what the potential could be if established with uh, native landscape. And then an image for that local church. Um, we've sort of, we're working to uh, plan to hopefully have some sort of um, enhancement to this uh, historic site, maybe memorialize it to some extent in a way that functions for them. And, and this is part of what's so exciting about bringing the trail through these areas is we feel like we're bringing design to places that haven't historically had it. Um, this is an image um, in between the Pondberry Bay Preserve and Roseboro. Um, NCDOT was willing to grant um, money for a roadside environmental unit to do um, native plantings in and around this intersection where the MST will be crossing. So we're excited to see that come to fruition as well. Uh, the next site is in Cumberland County, uh, kind of on the border with Bladen County at Bushy Lake State Natural Area and Suggs Mill Pond State Game Land. This is just an incredible area, uh, you know, a lot of beautiful, well-preserved landscapes and a lot of conservation work ongoing. And this is a view looking through Suggs Mill Pond State Game Land to Bushy Lake in the distance. Uh, just this beautiful sea of green. Uh, this is Horseshoe Lake in Suggs Mill Pond State Game Land and the trail crosses right by uh, this site currently. Uh, we have um, 4.7 miles of trail right now. Um, it's our first trail since basically uh, Bentonville Battlefield in Johnston County. This is the first trail um, that we currently have. And it's, a, it's been really great for us to work with the Wildlife Resource Commission and we're excited to be planning to <clears throat> expand our trail into the Bushy Lake State Natural Area um, and to increase from 4.7 to 22.4 miles of trail uh, once we're able to uh, move forward with these land acquisitions. Brunswick Timber LLC has already said they're willing to sell this property. Um, and so we're just kind of going through the process of, of pulling that money together. Uh, the fourth area uh, is in Bladen County, and it's, uh, we're calling it the Three Lakes area, but it's really focused around the White Lake, Jones Lake State Park, uh, Elizabethtown Center. And this has been a, an amazing area where we've had a lot of support and a lot of success so far, where we've been able to really anchor the trail in the beginning. This is a drone photo I took of Jones Lake State Park, and I just, um, I don't think the Carolina Bays get nearly enough credit or nearly enough visitation or appreciation. And so we're really excited to help showcase these features. So currently we have nine, uh, a little over nine miles of trail in this area where we enter um, the Bladen Lake State Forest and Jones Lake State Park um, area on the western side, um, follow forest roads through the park, and then enter this area, which is Turnbull Creek Educational State Forest, another really great partner for us. And so our current plan is uh, moving forward where we only need a bridge over Turnbull Creek to complete this section, a new, a new six miles um, over here to Sweet Home Church Road. Um, and then from that point forward, we're looking at land acquisition uh, to connect other publicly owned land um, to connect with our current trail at Singletary Lake State Park. Um, but it's just a really exciting area. We have a lot of support from the local community. They're in the process. They're already one, um, one step into and continuing the process of building a multi-use path around White Lake, uh, which we'll be using part of. Uh, the East Coast Greenway is also cutting right through here. Um, and NCDOT is gonna be rebuilding uh, the bridge, the 701 bridge across the Cape Fear River and adding a pedestrian and bike lane to that facility. So we just think this area is really well positioned to be um, uh, just a fantastic place for people to experience these Eastern North Carolina landscapes. Um, and this location here that I was describing, the crossing of Turnbull Creek, uh, we're really excited because there's a campground there that has really, this is a rendering of the potential for the campground and the bridge crossing of Turnbull Creek right now. It's just a primitive campground that is rarely used, unadvertised, 
Um, and it's got a lot of really beautiful intact longleaf pine habitat and bottomland forest. Um, Atlantic white cedars in here along um, Turnbull Creek, but people just don't really know about it. And so we're excited to be bringing attention and some funds to help revamp this camp around the mountains to sea trail um, and have a new kind of anchor point on the other side of Jones Lake State Park. Um, this is the image. This is the crossing here of Turnbull Creek where you've got this 25 foot uh, sandy bluff with the campground in the background here and then it connects across to forest roads and Blaine Lake State Forest on the other side. We don't know exactly what the long-term um, bridge will be here, but we're working to get a temporary bridge in place so that people can start hiking here. Uh, the next location is um, what we're calling the Cape Fear uh, River Levee, also known as the White Oak Dyke. Um, and this is an image of the current state of this levee. Um, it was built in the 1920s. It's a 14 and a half mile long earthen levee that was built to protect the farmland of Southern Bladen and Western Pender counties um, around Kelly, if you're familiar with Kelly or Cane Tuck. Um, and it was breached in the 60s and rebuilt um, by the Army Corps of Engineers. And um, here's another image of a different site um, unfortunately, um, during basically from the 80s on, um, the Lion Swamp and Kelly Dyke District um, councils, which were in charge of taxing uh, the local community and maintaining the dike, uh, really stopped doing that um, for many reasons. And so that's why you've got all of these uh, trees growing through the dike and um, a lot of the outlet structures where streams cross the dike have completely kind of worn through. So the Army Corps of Engineers actually abandoned the property or at least they no longer recognize it as an official um, ACOE project. And so what happened after, shortly after that was Hurricane Florence, Matthew and Florence. And this is an image of one of the multiple breaches in the White Oak Dike. You can see here, uh, the breach starts about here. So the dike is, you know, about 10 feet, 12 feet tall here. Um, and it was just a massive um, break. And almost all the breaches happened where there were forest roads or logging roads or private landowners roads going over top of the, uh, the levee and sort of, um, sort of reducing its ability to, to withhold the water. And so since then, um, the community has rebuilt those breaches with a grant from the state, but they have not um, really addressed the issue of the long-term maintenance needs and upgrades for this to be a functional uh, stormwater control um, feature in the landscape. And so this red line here represents um, the Mountains to Sea Trail uh, along the top of this dike. It's a little bit longer, but we would jump off on this road here. Our current uh, route again is in the black dotted line and the purple properties represent you know the the properties that the private properties that are intersected by um, uh, the levee and the Coastal Land Trust actually has a property here um, on the north side of the levee or just north of the levee um, and then Whitehall Plantation game land there's a couple um, holdings along the levee as well and so you know, our goal here, and we're working with the Bladen County Manager, Greg Martin, and with the Army Corps of Engineers as they're um, seeking uh, funding and a new project to uh, renovate the levy um, to, to be up to standards for our current environment. And uh, we're hoping, and we have so far good feedback on becoming a maintenance and oversight partner, such that in the process of, you know, reconstructing or, or renovating this levee, they would create an access road along the top of it that would also function as the Mountains to Sea Trail so that we can do vegetative control, um, we can keep an eye out for any issues, um, we can, you know, serve that function that they strug have struggled historically um, to keep up with, uh, while also getting this great recreational amenity that would be a very low cost to us, uh, especially if the Army Corps of Engineers is is building this project. So um, we're working on the section 408 um, or the permit um, that would allow for this non-essential use 
Uh, we'll see how it all works out. It may be a longer term uh, project than some of the others, but we're really, really excited for the opportunity to, in this location, maybe be, um, rather than in other areas where we are coming in post-conservation work, maybe we could help anchor future conservation um, and land acquisition uh, in this area as we sort of help change its dynamic. Uh, this is just a rendering, quick rendering I did of a 3D model based on uh, the levee as it cuts through Whitehall Plantation game land. So it's a pretty tall levee um, and we're not exactly sure what the long-term needs of the Army Corps will be as far as vegetative control, but um, at any rate, it'll be a great vantage point for seeing the, the wildlife there. Um, our next focus area is at Holly Shelter Game Land, which I know is uh, probably the nearest and um, maybe most easily accessible area for a lot of you and your constituents. Um, it's been a great place for us. We currently have 19 miles of trail along forest roads there, and it's, it's really just um, uh, an amazing sea of green, and I've enjoyed getting to experience it. Um, throughout the different parts of the year. I mean, obviously the winter is my favorite, um, but uh, we think it's just such a great place that people don't know enough about. Um, and it's so largely used for hunting purposes, but the Wildlife Resource Commission is really interested in, in supporting new uses and new users that they see um, are rising um, in this area. And so uh, we're working with them in a couple different ways, but um, you can see here our 19 mile route on forest roads um, and then our proposed uh, new route um, which would be essentially another five miles um, and the reason we we want to to do this particular expansion is one we currently have uh, hikers coming out onto highway 17 and hiking along highway 17 for a little over four miles until they go down on 210 towards surf city and it's it's not safe, it's not pleasant. And um, the other thing is this area represents an opportunity to have a part of Holly Shelter accessible where hunting is not the primary function um, and wildlife is interested in, in that as well and how especially the interface over here uh, near the intersection of 210, there can be more of a, um, a pedestrian uh, non-hunting sort of gateway to experiencing Holly Shelter. And so the, the real thing standing in the way is land acquisition, um, as is the case in many of these locations. Uh, fortunately, uh, this property is owned by Sleepy Creek Farms and they had already worked um, with the Nature Conservancy and the Military and Wildlife Resource Commission to try to sell this property in 2006. Um, for various reasons, it fell apart um, and they're now, um, reapproaching Sleepy Creek Farms is reapproaching Wildlife Resource Commission saying they'd like to get this done um, and so we're optimistic that um, we can help be a good partner and bring in some part of funding to help acquire these properties um, because this is the best way through to um, to really avoid you know inter interacting with too much Pocosin streamhead areas um, because of it being the high ground currently having roads so um, at this site, we've, we've done a little bit further uh, dive and analysis. Um, this slide shows some of what I find fascinating about the location and have brought into the design work is its history as the shoreline. And currently, you know, you have this upland longleaf pine area, but this LIDAR elevation data has these very distinct zones you can see representing our current coastline, the coastline from a million years ago, and then the coastline from two million years ago, which is really, you know, the area where we're planning to work and try and establish this trailhead facility. And so I'm trying to bring that sort of historic dune ecosystem theme forward. Um, and so we've put together a proposal uh, with Pender County for a trailhead and environmental education center that would hopefully serve a lot of different purposes, both to showcase um, all of the native landscapes, um, moving the Hampstead Fire Tower and making it an iconic gathering place, um, and providing a, a location for educational um, events, uh, controlled burn demonstrations, um, really whatever the community wants and needs, but an opportunity for people 
to really experience Holly Shelter in a way that you can't on some of those forest roads in, in the largely hunted areas. Um, and so, so just some images from this ideation is taking that dune concept and applying it to uh, a sustainably built uh, structure with a green roof and, and passive solar gain. Um, understanding that this landscape is going to largely be used in the winter time, um, as is the case in many of these coastal places. Um, we've gotten permission from the Forest Service. They're not going to be selling any more of their old fire towers, so hopefully we can preserve these uh, and, and keep them as a sort of a piece of history at multiple sites across the Coastal Crescent, but definitely here. Um, this is sort of an aerial view of how it would tie into the trail on an existing logging road. Um, but we're just really excited to have these opportunities. Um, and right now, Pender County, um, we're going to be working with Pender County to take the next steps forward because land acquisition will be um, first and foremost. Uh, the last focus area um, is uh, what we're calling the Camp Lejeune and Croatan Rail with Trail. And so there is a 30 mile or 35 mile long railroad that goes from Cherry Point um, Marine Corps Air Station all the way to Camp Lejeune and it's a very rarely used rail corridor and it's a very wide rail corridor so typically a rail corridor is maybe 75 feet wide. Um, this one is often 300 to 350 feet wide so there's lots of space to have a trail and have it very separated from the railroad itself. Um, so the trail would tie in to the existing greenways um, in Jacksonville. So the Mountains to Sea Trail currently follows a greenway here in the background through uh, the Montford Point, uh, Point Marine Memorial. Um, this is a drone photo of the, um, the railroad trussel for this DOD railroad as it's crossing through Stella, North Carolina on the White Oak River. And just beautiful, beautiful landscapes. Um, and then this is an image of um, the New Sea Oak Trail in Croatan where we'd have the opportunity to break off of the rail corridor and experience some of the more intimate components of uh, Croatan. So it's this amazing corridor that connects two large communities on the coast and cuts through some really, really beautiful landscapes. Um, so the Western portion of this um, is what we'll look at first. And this purple here represents um, the Marine Corps base Camp Lejeune. And then everything, just like the other maps in the sort of darkened aerials is public land. And then we have the Nature Conservancy's Horse Swamp Preserve here. So right now there's no trail um, outside of the greenway here in yellow and in Jacksonville. And hikers are currently walking uh, this roadway through Stella and into Croatan. And so the corridor cuts right through a lot of this uh, uh, undeveloped land, timberland, and would provide 12 miles of uninterrupted trail to connect to the White Oak River. And we're just really excited about that possibility. Uh, the second uh, section of this rail corridor comes from Stella uh, through Croatan National Forest, uh, through this large private inholding, um, and then into downtown Havelock and Cherry Point. Um, this map includes the soon to be built US 70 bypass, uh, which Fortunately, um, we think we'll be easy enough to get past um, and around um, if the trail ends up following this uh, proposed route. Um, but the nice thing about it is it really connects through Croatan and right now there really are not through trails in Croatan outside of, you know, the New Siak on the far east side just because it's such a challenging wet landscape and then a lot of those high ground areas are privately held. So you can see our current route is very fragmented um, on forest roads in the southern side. And we, we do envision there still being these trails on the southern side. But the challenge has been we have hikers walking along Highway 70 here, and it's a real problem for us. And, and there's not a really good way to get through Newport. So this would solve a lot of problems for state parks and, and Croatan. Um, and we're really excited to to move forward and see if we can get this uh, proposal to work. Now, there is pressure from the local communities to um, have um, commercial use of this rail corridor as well, that the DOD is um, 
trying to negotiate how they feel about right now. They're, they're more interested in having the mountains to see trail than having commercial traffic. Um, but we don't see that as, you know, those as mutually exclusive uses. If, if there's access for uh, timber extraction um, on the railroad, we don't think that would inhibit our ability to establish the trail either. So that's kind of the, the real quick deep dive on these different focus areas uh, that we're working on. And I'd be more than happy to answer questions or um, talk in more detail about um, anything I can. Thanks, Ben. That's, that's super cool. Um, you guys have a really neat vision and um, it, it's really neat to see how you're thinking about connecting um, conservation lands and creating new conservation lands in, in this area as well. Um, so yeah, Ben is available to answer questions if anybody ha oh, has one. There was one in the chat earlier um, about li the LIDAR data um, and the source of that LIDAR data on a couple of your slides. Um, curious about that. Yeah, so um, LIDAR data is available through the North Carolina Department of Emergency Management. They have a website portal, it's called their Spatial Data Download, and you just have to make an account. Um, let me get back to it. And what you can do is you can get either the .las files, which are the actual point files of the lasers that came down from the airplane, or you can get what's called the DEM, the Digital Elevation Model, and that's what I would recommend. That is essentially a raster image with, um, you know, dark being the lowest, like black being the lowest and white being the highest. And then what I've done with that is I've taken that NGIS and I've built um, what's called a hill shade model. I'm getting kind of to the nerdy details here, but you can do that. And then you can apply um, the colored raster to the hill shade raster um, in Adobe. Uh, I did it in Adobe Illustrator. Um, and you can change the color ramp. So for me, I thought blue to yellow makes a nice image. But yeah, it's really, really great data. And you can take it um, and you can get small amounts or large amounts. You can make contours out of it. Um, and for Eastern North Carolina, it's fairly up to date. Um, it's only a few years old. And you can just see all these amazing traces in the landscape, canals, ditches. Um, yeah, it's just... Um, it's really a beautiful thing. <laughs> That's really cool. It's, it's amazing how much detail you can see. Like you can see edges of, um, of Carolina Bays in this picture that we're looking at. Like that's just amazing. Yeah, it's been, uh, I think a transformative piece of technology really. That's cool. There was a comment about um, your renderings. Um, very, very cool, beautiful. Um, so well done. Um, and then, are there plans for the MST to go through the North River Wetlands Preserve near Smyrna? That is a very well-timed question. Uh, ah! so we just had a meeting um, a day and a half ago with the Coastal Federation. And so uh, you're talking about this area right here. Um, and so it is already dedicated by state parks. Um, the problem has been getting access from the west side. And so the, um, the, the river there is very wide and marshy and um, the properties to the sort of the, um, the headwater area, the more elevated area are owned by Weyerhaeuser and there's some hunting leases there and some challenges. But we just got a $50,000 grant from Duke Energy to work on a project um, in this area, in Carteret County. And so we had that meeting to say, we're ready to move forward and make a plan um, and see how we can best apply this money and maybe leverage it toward more money. So um, we are just starting the process of working on that. Um, and I, I think we're well positioned uh, to move forward with that in the next few years. I, I have no idea how long it may or may not take. Um, but we're putting money toward it now. And, and I will say across the coastal crescent, I'm always interested in finding out from people about opportunities they may know about. I've done a lot of analysis, but there, there's only these seven focus areas we're currently working on, but there are 
25 different other areas we would like to be working on as well. So we're, we're going to be trying to find um, where things are, where there's opportunities and then continue to try and um, bring in new places to study, analyze and find a plan for. Very cool. Um, I got a question about trail use. And um, so in addition to pedestrian trails, does the MST support bicycle <clears throat> traffic? And if not, why not? So the Mountains to Sea Trail, our, our mission really outlines pretty clearly that we are to be focused on natural surface pedestrian trails. That being said, um, we also almost pretty much exclusively outside of state parks defer to the land manager. So there are locations where we follow greenways um, because that's what the local man land manager wanted and needed for their purpose. And then there are areas where there is mountain biking allowed. Um, but any area where we are creating new trail, we are not planning for it to be bikes necessarily. It's just not our focus. There are areas, for example, in Bladen Lake State Forest, where they're happy to have bikes and our trail cuts through there. And we're fine with that, especially when it's on like a forest road where there's less impacts um, of a mountain bike, for example. Um, so the, <laughs> the answer is really, it depends. Um, but we understand, um, we understand that mountain biking has a really negative impact on uh, landscapes in general, you know, for, you know, erosion reasons and for trampling of, you know, sensitive plants reasons, trampling maybe isn't the best word, but um, so we think there's a, there's a place for bikes, but it's not usually on the MST. There is a great, if this person asking the question is interested in biking, um, there are really good biking facilities just south of Elizabethtown. Um, but um, yeah, we see that as a where possible and where there's not a negative impact situation. Okay. Um, this is a, maybe a, a similar or follow-up question um, about community support. So you were just talking about kind of deferring to preferences of land managers. So um, how vital is community support in your efforts to establish the trail system? Um, it is absolutely critical. And it is um, something that has, uh, I didn't necessarily really understand coming into this project. Um, I went through landscape architecture school and I was, I was like, I'm gonna go plan and design parks and I'm gonna just have an idea and build it, make something nice, make something sustainable. Um, and then this project emerged as something so amazing to me and such a great opportunity opportunity to learn and leave a legacy that I thought, oh, well, now I'm so excited to accomplish these things and jump right in. Um, but I realized very quickly that you can really only go as far as the support you have. I'm only one person. And these places are places that um, are, n there's not a culture of hiking and trail use in a lot of these places. Um, that's not been the predominant outdoor recreation. And so, you know, I've found that um, there are a lot of people coming out to support and help build, build trail. Um, and that that is going to be critical to our mission, not only to get public support for allowing the trail to go places and getting funding for the trail, but also to get people to use it and to get people excited about it. So our goal and in other areas of the state, um, we've been successful in, in creating the trail, helping support the trail, but then allowing local volunteers, local nonprofits um, to really take it and run with it. And that model has been really successful for us. So my hope is that where we're currently building trail and expanding it and building that trail community, um, I'll be able to have a local leader, advocate, or group of them that can take it on so that I can move on to the next spot and help establish the trail. So it's really important for a lot of reasons. It's really important to us and understanding what's appropriate, you know, um, in these different areas where we should or shouldn't have trail. Um, cause there's so many people who know so much more than us about these places. 
Fair enough. Um, there's a question um, about uh, from a, a, a newcomer to North Carolina. So um, the question is, how do you segregate hunting activities from hiking for safety sake? Are hiking trails closed during certain hunt hunting seasons, for example? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's something that we're still trying to find the best solutions to. So currently, we have trail on state game lands. Uh, we have trail in state forest areas that have limited hunting. Uh, we have trail in private properties with uh, a variety of different hunting activities. And we have different strategies in each location. So again, it kind of depends on the land manager. Um, we have a couple arrangements like in the Sora Town Mountains outside of Hanging Rock um, State Park. That's privately owned land where we have trail, but we just shut that trail for a few months out of the year when they're using it for hunting. And that works fine in that location. And then at Bladen Lake State Forest, um, the trails are open during the hunting season, the same as Holly Shelter Game Land, but we, we post and we post on our website and on trail kiosks, people need to be wearing orange and be aware of um, you know, where they are at all times. And we have not had a ton of issues to date. I think the main issue is the level of comfort people have with that is challenging and I don't blame them for that. And so uh, in some areas, hunting is not allowed on Sundays still. And we worked really hard um, in the recent sort of public engagement process for Sunday hunting in North Carolina to advocate such so that all the places where the trail or other, our trail or other state trails interface with game lands, that those would not be the game lands that allowed Sunday hunting. So we're fortunate in that Sundays, even in hunting season are days where people can go and feel safe in the game lands hiking. Um, in addition to um, some other days of the week, for example, Bladen Lake State Forest, there's only hunting on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So all this information varies and it's really, our, part of one of our biggest missions is to try and communicate that to the public. Um, but I will say that there's a bigger discussion here, which is about these conflicting user groups and how to move forward with that. Um, because I think one of the most special things about the Mountains to Sea Trail and all trails is that it's one of those few places where someone from who has very different views can agree uh, with another person you know like uh, we've got just to be um, just to go with sort of a stereotype but like let's say you have a very conservative uh, politically conservative hunter um, and then you have a very politically liberal uh, birder who want to use the same area they both can use the trail and appreciate the trail and the landscape and agree on on the need to maintain and support that landscape and I think that's a really valuable opportunity for us as a society and so we're in the process of trying to figure it out one thing we've looked into is um, hiking permits so that we can help with funding because one of the main issues hunters are not as into having hikers on the hunting uh, hunting lands is because we're not paying in the same way that they're paying for that property um, and so if we were able to create some sort of annual hiking permit that would bring money to the Wildlife Resource Commission, that could be really effective. But we are open to any and all ideas on, on how to, to work through this shared use situation because it's going to be a really important one, especially in Eastern North Carolina. Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks for all the awesome questions um, yeah. from the attendees today, and thank you for taking the extra time to um, to answer those for us, Ben. We do appreciate it. A little co a comment just came in. Shared use, well said, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's really what it, what it boils down mm -hmm. to. Um, I want to let everybody know that we are going to take the next couple weeks off from Little Lunch Lectures for Christmas and New Year's Day, but we will be back on Friday, January the 8th. And um, another one of the conservation partners in Eastern North Carolina, um, Lauren Colodi from the Coastal Federation will be here. And the topic is the partnership efforts to conserve um, bird islands. So 
down the coast, basically as far as you can go, just before South Carolina is Bird Island. And um, that's a really, really neat um, place and a really neat story. So join us that day to, to learn more about Bird Island. Um, we are still collecting um, tribute stories for Camilla. If you would like to send a short message to us using the tribute app um, to say, uh, thank you or farewell or tell a shit funny story about Camilla with us um, in celebration of her upcoming retirement. Um, that link is is live and still collecting stories. Um, I think that's about all of the announcements I have for today except for to say um, have wonderful holidays coming up and um, hope everyone has um, some time to rest and relax and get outside. So um, again, thanks Ben. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, we'll see you guys in the new year. Take care. Take care everybody. Thanks.